Feeding the Flame by Tuesday Love Sang Rampa, read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful BC. Chapter 12 If you don't believe in others, how can you expect others to believe in you? The old man lay back on his bed. The evening sun was just setting behind the low hills, sending its last rays gleaming on the placid water of the St. John River. Off to the left, the paper factory was still belching out furious clouds of smoke and steam as it did twenty-four hours a day, obscuring the sky and polluting the atmosphere. Into the river poured all the waste products, making an incredible stench in the air of St. John a stench about which everyone complained, and about which no one did anything. The snows were melting fast. This was spring, the start of spring. But now, with the fast-setting sun dipping behind the hills, birds were scurrying along in droves, hurrying to get home to their perches while the light yet held. Directly below the window, Sinjin, a telepathic cat, was singing a lonely song, inviting all the cat ladies of the neighborhood to come and be welcomed by him. His voice rose and fell, quavering with the intensity of his emotion. From time to time he stopped, raised his head high, and even sat upright on his back legs like a rabbit while he listened intently for any calls that his invitation was being accepted. Disappointed that he had no such intimation, he dropped to all fours again, and with his tail twitching with emotion, he started all over again like an old-time London costermonger crying his wares but nothing of any old iron, any old rags. No, this was a different cry. Love for free, come quick, I'm waiting. Cars drove up with a roar and a clatter, and storekeepers and their assistants drove into the parking lot with much elan, and got out of their cars with great slamming of doors and calling of good night, good night, before hurrying up the steps in the constant fight to get room in the elevator. The old man lay back and thought of the past, thought of the difficulties of this life, thought of the few, few pleasures and the many, many hardships. A hard life, yes, he thought. But praise be, the last time on this round, the last time on this earth. And now, he thought, I have just about cleared up all that has to be done, cleared up all those empty corners, turned out the attics, even tossed out the garbage. Not so, not so, said a familiar and well-loved voice. The task is not yet ended. You have done more than you came to do, but the task is not yet ended. The old man turned on his side, and there, right close to him, was the super-astral figure of the Lama Mignardondap, smiling and with a brilliant gold radiance. "'You quite startled me,' said the old man, "'and I wish you'd turn your lights low. "'It reminds me of when I was in England, in London.' "'Oh, and what was that?' asked the Lama Mingyardondap. Is it something which I do not know? I think it must be, said the old man. Let me tell you about it. I was in a building in South Kensington late at night, and I was sitting in the dark thinking, 
just thinking over things, just meditating, and for some reason I had not pulled the blinds. Suddenly there came a tremendous knocking at the door down below. I started back to awareness, and I went down to see what was the cause of the commotion. Two big, beefy London bobbies were there. Sir, said one, a sergeant I saw by his stripes, what are you doing in this building? Doing, I replied. I don't think I was doing anything. I was just sitting thinking, as a matter of fact. Well, replied the sergeant, we were called here in a great hurry because you were shining very bright lights out of the window. Oh, I replied, and most certainly was not, but if I had been, is that a crime? The sergeant looked at his subordinate and shrugging his shoulders said, Well, it might be, you know. You might be signaling to a crime gang to show that the road is clear or something. And then he came to a decision. I want to search the place. So I said, Have you a search warrant? No, he replied, but if you don't give me permission to search the place, I could leave the constable here to watch you while I go and get the necessary warrant. So I just shrugged my shoulders and said, All right, go where you like, look where you like. So the two policemen wandered around, looked at everything, and, most extraordinarily of all, they pulled out the drawers of my desk and looked inside. I don't know what they thought they would find there, but, anyway, after about three-quarters of an hour, they appeared satisfied, and as they were leaving, the sergeant said, Don't do it again, sir, please. It makes too much work. And off they went. The Lama Mingyar Dondaf laughed. Whatever you do, Lob sang, you seem to attract the wrong sort of attention. I can't think of anyone else who would be almost arrested just for showing his aura when he was thinking. The old man was looking a bit gloomy as he said, So you think my task is not finished, eh? What haven't I done now? The Lama Mingyar Dandap replied, You've done everything. It's not a question that you have left anything undone. You have done more, much more than you came here to do. But it so happens that through the failure of others, there is still more to do. What? asked the old man. The Lama Mingyar Dandap looked down his nose and tried not to smile, as he said, There may be another book to make the twelfth. We shall have to think about it. It would certainly be appreciated, but there is another little task which has to be done, something in connection with an invention which may yet burst upon this startled world. For some time, the old man and the Lama Mingyar Dandap discussed things, but this is not the place to disclose all that was said. The old man, sick almost to death, and with expenses mounting through medical bills and other vital expenditures, wondered how he was going to stick it for even a few months longer. At last, the super-astral of the Lama Mingyar Dandap faded, and the failing daylight took over once again. Time! What a strange thing is this artificial time! One could travel from the astral world here and back in the twinkling of an eye, and yet, down here, on this earth, one was bound by the clock and by the motion of the sun controlling the clock. Here in New Brunswick, the sun was setting. A few thousand miles away, John Henderson would still be busy at his work about in the middle of the afternoon. 
not so far away Valerie Sorok, that paragon of loyalty and exactitude, would probably be just leaving her office and probably thinking of her tea. Yes, most certainly, thought the old man. Valerie would be thinking of her tea because one weakness was that she thought too much of food. I shall have to talk to her about her diet, thought the old man to himself. In the other direction, the Worstman ladies would probably be at home very late in the evening, perhaps listening to the radio, perhaps studying, and perhaps one of them just about to go on night duty. But here, the ladies, Taddy and Cleo, were having their evening play, chasing around with a favorite toy, and the favorite toy was a nice soft woolly belt from a dressing gown. The old man thought of Taddy and Cleo, thought of how, since they were born, they had been treated as human children, how everything had been done to make them feel that they were entities as important as any humans, and the task had been most fruitful. The results had been most gratifying, for these two little people were indeed real people. From midnight until midday, Miss Cleo was mentioned first, but from midday until midnight, Miss Taddy's name was mentioned first, and so they were assured of quite equal treatment without any trace of favoritism. Miss Taddy, ample, plump, and comfortable looking, loves to crouch down behind one of the scratch pads, while the extremely beautiful, very slender, very graceful Miss Cleo bounces up and down and does wildly improbable feline gymnastics. But the night was growing darker, the air was growing colder, and there was still a nip of frost about. Outside, the red of the thermometer was dropping. Outside, people on the road were well muffled up. The old man had been looking forward to this day, the day when the eleventh book would be ended, and then he could push aside all thoughts of writing and say, Never any more. It's all over. No more writing. My time on earth has just about finished. But now... With the visit from the super astral of the Lama Mingyar Dandap, well, the old man thought, isn't one's task ever ended? Is one driven along like a rickety old car until it finally falls to pieces? I'm just about in pieces now, he thought. But there it is. What will be will be. And when a task has to be done, it will not be done unless there is someone there to do it. So, thought the old man, I must try to hang on a little longer. And as for writing another book, who knows? It might be good to make the number in English up to twelve. He thought, I would like to tell everyone, everyone throughout the world, that all these books are true, everything related in these books is true, and that is a definite statement. So, we come to the end of what is not a perfect day after all, because the task is not ended, the final battle is not yet won, there is more to be done and little time and little health with which to do it. We can but try. Here and now, let me offer my most grateful thanks to Mrs. Sheila Rouse, alias Buttercup, for the immense care and work she has devoted to typing my books. Care and work which is appreciated perhaps more than she knows let me offer my thanks to Rab 
for the extreme care and accuracy with which she has checked everything and made truly worthwhile suggestions. She has aided my task. And finally, but by no means least, let me thank Miss Tatalinka and Miss Cleopatra Rampa for the encouragement and the entertainment that they have given me. These two dear little people have made it worth while to continue a little longer, for never, in the whole of their four years of life, have they shown any spite, any bad temper, or not even any irritation. If humans were as equable and sweet-natured as these two, there would be no trouble on the earth, no wars then it would indeed be the golden age for which people must yet wait. And so at the last we come in this book to the time when we can say the end. End of chapter 12 and end of Feeding the Flame